Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. It is Monday, December 27th. Hope you all had a great holiday. First on the docket, I need you to go take a look at the video that we just put up today after a press conference from the district attorney regarding the 110-year sentence for the trucker. Go check it out. Next, the jury resumes deliberations in the Ghislaine Maxwell case. Alex Murdoch gets some charges dismissed. Kim Potter spends her Christmas in custody. The DA wants the Crumley parents to stay in custody. Wait until you hear about this assault that took place on an airplane and why. A perverted pastor gets punched. Uh, Some poor judgment. As the year comes to an end, we have another contestant for the mother of the year. Another man released for a crime he didn't commit 23 years after the fact. Did this guy not get what he wanted for Christmas? And finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. All right, aficionados, it is Monday, December 27th. Before we get to the docket, a quick shout out to one of our longtime subscribers and Patreon members, Mama Pink. That's right. She sent a Christmas present to Miss Winnie the Bulldog. Thank you, Mama Pink. Didn't have to do that. Greatly appreciated, though. Miss Winnie got a hoot out of it. Although the little collar she kind of bugged her after a little bit. Anyway, but thank you. All right. Let's get to the docket. First, the 110-year sentence for the trucker. Well, the district attorney uh, held a brief press conference today after a hearing was held basically via WebEx about scheduling issues. That matter has been set to January 13th at 1.30. We will try to uh, bring you that hearing live if it takes place on that day. But I go through the analysis as to why the court may not be able to do anything very quickly. And second of all, um, it kind of looks political versus following the law. Go check out the video. Uh, I think it's pretty good analysis. All right. Next on the docket, the jurors in the Ghislaine Maxwell resumed deliberations uh, after Christmas break. When the jurors returned, they asked for a whiteboard and some different colored sticky notes uh, on Monday morning, suggesting that they had uh, plenty to work to do after a long holiday weekend. The jurors also requested the transcripts of some of the trial testimony and the definition of enticement. Now, Judge Nathan referred them to her legal instructions that she read to them before they began deliberations a week ago. Now, Miss Maxwell obviously spent her 60th birthday, which was Saturday on Christmas, behind bars at the New York's Metropolitan Detention Center. The jury entered their third full day of deliberations today after hearing from over two dozen witnesses over the course of three weeks. Now, the court uh, provided transcripts, and I've never seen a court be able to provide certified transcripts that everybody could agree upon. That normally is not the normal case, so to speak, but I guess when you're Ghislaine Maxwell, it's a high profile case, guess what? exceptions are made. Obviously, we will bring you the news as to when a verdict is reached, but it sounds like somebody is hunkering down one way or the other and really looking at the evidence to see whether the government has proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt to each and every element of the offense charged or whether they failed to do so. Let's just wait and see. Next on the docket, Alex Murdoch. That's right. He gets some relief. The South Carolina Attorney General's Office has dropped two felony breach of trust charges against uh, now former attorney Alex Murdoch uh, last week for his alleged role in the scheme to steal $4.3 million from Gloria Satterfield's family. The two charges dropped on December 20th. Uh, in the Beaufort County Courthouse or for obtaining signatures or property under false pretenses of allegedly over $10,000 or more. Now, according to the Attorney General's office, these charges were absorbed into one of the 12 indictments against Mr. Murdoch that were handed down by the state grand jury over the past several months. Now, Mr. Murdoch continues to be held at the Richland County Detention Center in South Carolina on a $7 million bond set by Judge Allison Lee. I don't think he's going to be able to make that bond, but it is interesting how those two original charges were at least a placeholder to have a warrant put in place for Mr. Murdoch, get him brought back, have him extradited back from Florida where he was undergoing uh, uh, drug treatment and ultimately 
bought the prosecution some time to bring more charges. I don't think he had a Merry Christmas. Well, just like Kim Potter, remember the taser cop? She was remanded after the jury found her guilty of both reckless and negligent manslaughter uh, last week, and the judge revoked her bond, and she is being held in custody for sentencing, which will be sometime in February. Now, Potter was then transferred to the Minnesota Correctional Facility at the Shakopee. I'm sure I mispronounced that, but it's S-H-A-K-O-P-E-E. Shakopee, a five-level security prison located about 25 miles southwest of downtown Minneapolis. Now, this facility cares for about 650 female prisoners and offers a variety of in-prison programs designed to help in rehabilitation, including 5K runs and opportunities to further their education. Now, in the brochure, the correctional facility showcases inmates studying, sewing, and tending to a garden. One inmate is reportedly working towards a law degree, and the convicted ex-cop will remain in the facility until at least her sentencing. While it's likely it's unclear if she will be serving her entire sentence at that facility. And that is a case with uh, Kim Potter. I just don't know what to do with. Clearly, she screwed up. 26 years of training, all gone in one minute, I mean, seconds really, when she should have grabbed her taser, which was all the training she should have done, she grabbed her gun. Is it an accident? Is it negligence? Well, it creates a bigger issue. On the reckless theory is you have to say that you know that a dangerous situation exists, that she must realize that she had her gun and she fired it anyway. It was pretty clear she thought she had her taser. So is that reckless if you don't recognize the fear? Maybe it was just an accident. But I have a real problem with negligence. Okay, negligence is a civil standard. Negligence is a reasonably foreseeable. What would a reasonable person do? Well, that's the problem with criminal law is that we have turned what should normally be a civil remedy into criminal consequences. And well, it basically just criminalizes everything that should remain in the civil courts. Um, the Supreme Court uh, Justice, Judge Gorsuch, uh, when he was on the 10th Circuit, had a real problem with a negligent standard when it comes to criminal cases because it's a reasonable person standard. Our criminal justice system is designed based upon knowing conduct. What was the person thinking when they committed the crime? If you're going to hold people accountable under what other people should do on a armchair quarterback kind of situation where you're looking back with 2020 vision, it could be dangerous for lots and lots of people. Something to think about. Let me know what you think. Next, remember Jennifer and James Crumley? Yeah, that's right. The parents to the uh, alleged shooter up there in Michigan. Well, prosecutors in a filing say the parents of the alleged Oxford High School uh, shooter, Ethan Crumley, are at a greater risk of flight now when they were arraigned on involuntary manslaughter charges earlier this month. It's also alleged that the couple willfully ignored the needs and well-being of their son and the threat he posed to others. Now, in their filings, they stated that the defendants were in a better position than anyone else in the world to prevent this tragedy, but they failed to do so. Now, the Crumleys requested a modified bond last week, and the prosecution detailed in their filing how the couple is already $11,000 behind on their house payments, and they have sold their ho- horses which show they will flee if they get the opportunity. Now, the filing also details that the parents had four cell phones at the time of the arrest and attempted to destroy one of the phones. Now, the filings detail Ethan Crumley's state of mind in the six months before the shooting, saying his parents were aware that he was sadder than usual, that his only friend had moved away, and that he was sending his mother disturbing texts about his state of mind. Prosecutors allege that while their son was struggling, his parents spent several hours a night, three to four nights a week, at the barn caring for their horses, and that one of their parents was having extramarital affairs. Now, prosecutors emphasize that the defendants were focused on their own issues, including substance abuse issues. And perhaps the most disturbing part of the filing was that when the prosecutors alleged that Ethan Crumley had been torturing animals and kept a baby bird's head in a jar at his bedroom floor. Prosecutors then accused uh, the Crumleys of willful disregard of the clear evidence 
of their son posed a serious risk to other students on the day of the shooting. They argued that all the parents had to do was tell the school they recently purchased a gun for him, ask him where the gun was, open his backpack, or just take him home. Attached to the filing was the drawing made by Ethan Crumley on the day of the shooting. The picture includes a drawing of a gun and the words, the thoughts won't stop. Help me. The prosecutors also said in a school uh, shooting, it is not uncommon to find evidence of intent and planning after the shooting. What is novel about this case is the defendants were made aware in graphic form of the serious risk posed by their son prior to the shooting. And as we know, the teacher found the drawing on Ethan's geometry test and turned it over to the school officials who scheduled a meeting with the Crumleys and instructed the parents to provide counseling for their son within 48 hours of the meeting. The parents declined to take their son out of school that day and he was allowed to return to class. This is all according to the prosecutors. Now, after the shooting, the Crumleys retained attorneys for themselves, but not their son. And Jennifer Crumley said to a co-worker in a text that her son's destiny is done and she has to take care of herself. Can't necessarily disagree with that. Now, once again, this is a situation where if parents were prosecuted for everything that their children did, every parent should be afraid, particularly if you have a teenager that is depressed Okay, the parents said, I'm not gonna take him out of school, but they didn't say they weren't going to get him counseling within 48 hours. This has gotta be every parent's worst nightmare, not only to the deceased, but to the defendant's parents themselves. And I'm certainly not condoning it. You'd like to think that this was, you know, basically um, something that you would hope that the parents would intervene and know about. Okay, just because your kid is depressed, oh my God, a teenager depressed, uh, moping around, Oh my gosh, that's so novel. How could the parents have missed that, right? And think about it, ladies and gentlemen, in all of the other school shootings, and I'm not condoning them for God's sakes, I'm not, but how many times have the parents ever been prosecuted? Zero that I can think of, zero. Why? Because we don't hold other people accountable for another person's actions unless you actually agree, unless you are a complicitor or you are a co-conspirator. We don't, we just simply do not do that. Now, the Crumleys are may not gonna get the Parents of the Year Award, it sounds like. They got a lot of issues going on themselves, but the reality of it is we normally don't charge people for conduct of another. Think about it. Here in the state of Colorado, we had, you know, that whole school incident called Columbine, and there was lots of evidence that the parents you would think would know or should have known, or why didn't they know? They were never prosecuted because they didn't go in and actively participate or support the children in doing that. Now, it's not illegal to provide a teenager a firearm as a gift, and it was apparently locked up at the house, or they believed that the firearm was still locked up. They didn't believe that he had the firearm in his possession. And just saying, well, you should have done this. Well, they were under the belief, apparently, that the firearm was locked up. So why would they believe that they had to check the bag for the uh, firearm? Now, don't get me wrong. The kid, he needs to go away for a long, long time. He literally uh, destroyed families uh, with the death of four uh, young people whose lives were obviously taken far too soon. But the law is supposed to make decisions with neither passion nor prejudice, and you want to charge the people that are responsible, not the people you think you want to be responsible. All right, here's somebody that is responsible. I just don't understand what takes place on airlines these days, ladies and gentlemen. So a female passenger on a Delta flight from Tampa to Atlanta was arrested after attacking an 80-year-old man for not wearing a mask. Now get this, the attacker, she wasn't wearing a mask either. Patricia Cornwall allegedly targeted the victim when she saw he was taking off his mask to eat and drink while in his seat. Well, there's a novel idea. Well, apparently the two exchanged a few insults, which quickly turned into a physical altercation, and at least one crew member and one uh, passengers were reportedly injured while trying to get Cornwall off the elderly man. Now, in a video, Cornwall is seen hitting, scratching, and spitting on the unidentified older gentleman and yelling, Put your effing mask on now. A male flight crew member also demands Cornwall put her mask up as she continues to request that the crew ask the elderly man to pull his mask up. You put your mask down, biatch. The man responds as her mask is seen lowered below her chin. 
Did you call me a biatch, she asked. He responds, yes, I did. Cornwall is then seen smacking and scratching him in the face. Now you're going to go to jail, the man says. That's assault. Now, after the brief attack, she is escorted to the back of the plane by the flight attendants and was promptly arrested by the FBI at the Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport. Cornwall is due to appear in court for an initial appearance at the federal courthouse in Atlanta today. Next, a perv pastor gets punched. So we have an Oklahoma dad who sees the pastor touching his nine-year-old son inappropriately and then proceeds to crack his skull, fracturing his orbital socket. The 33-year-old perv, who is also a pastor, would apparently stop on his daily jog to touch the child at the bus stop. The nine-year-old victim told his father about the pastor's touching, and his father decided to wait at the bus stop to catch the perv himself. The father sat in the car and waited for the man to show up. The father watched the pastor place his hand on the child and move his hand to the child's backside. The father got out of the car to control the pastor who tried to flee the scene, shockingly. The father tackled the pastor and a fight broke out. The pastor was left with black and blue bruises all over his face and a fracture in his skull. Now, let's be honest, the orbital socket is one of the easier uh, bones to break, but it's still an assault. Now, the pastor was arrested and booked on a lewd, indecent act um, on a child and was fired by his church. Thank goodness. The dad has not been charged, which I don't think the district attorney will charge. I think that's one of those discretionary things and heat of passion. And what jury would find that man guilty? I don't think one would. I think that's called jury nullification if it goes to trial because the jury would say not guilty. Now, the police sometimes don't know all the answers when it comes to the law. So a North Carolina police chief has been suspended for reportedly telling officers that they could obtain a COVID vaccination card at a self-vaccination clinic. Now, Chief T.J. Smith of the Oak Borough, North Carolina Police Department, uh, was determined to have violated both the town personnel policy and a police department policy manual. The investigations allege that uh, the chief told officers and troopers there was a vaccination clinic where they could give. The investigation alleges that uh, Chief Smith told officers and troopers there was a vaccination clinic where they would be given a syringe to go into a bathroom to self-inject or dispose of the vaccine. Now, Smith allegedly said there was an arrangement with a pharmacist that either way, the officers would receive a vaccination card. Now, Smith reportedly told the investigators that he did not view anything wrong with this self-vaccination procedure as he was unfamiliar with the uh, policy at the time the, of the vaccine rules. Now, Smith also learned after doing research that the self-injection procedure was against the rules. Who knows? But... I guess that, what do they say, good initiative, poor judgment, uh, or just get the vaccine, or if you don't, I get it. Lots of issues there. We're not going to get into those, but I don't know. Let me know. Do you think the police chief did the right thing, or did he just uh, make a big old mess for himself that he shouldn't have been involved in? All right. You know, we've brought you Parents of the Year contestants, and well, we have one more contestant as the year and rapidly approaches. A woman allegedly had her 12-year-old daughter fly from Texas to Georgia for a man to sexually abuse. Investigators claimed that they learned that the mother, Adrienne Klein of Gulf Breeze, Florida, had her daughter travel to meet with 20-year-old Gessart Hoxha, G-E-S-A-R-T-H-O-X-H-A, I guess common pronunciation. Um, and he's a resident of Buford, Georgia. Now, detectives learned that Klein and Hoxha uh, facilitated the transportation of the 12-year-old across state lines, and police executed a search warrant at Hoxha's home. Large sums of cash, explicit photos of the victims were uncovered. Hoxha and the minor exchanged several messages online, including the explicit photos. Klein and Hoxha arranged travel to uh, the county for Klein's 12-year-old daughter by purchasing the flight for the child to fly from Texas to Gwinnett County and provided money for the hotel stay. Klein was charged with enticing a child for indecent purposes and cruelty to children in the second degree, and she is facing extradition from Florida 
to Georgia. Now, according to records from the Santa Rosa County, Florida Sheriff's Department, the records show that she was booked in on December 14th and remains locked up without bond. Hoxa is charged with multiple counts of abuse of a child, but online records from the Gwinnett County show he was released on a bond on December 15th. Ladies and gentlemen, what kind of people are there in the world? Well, people that do not have good intentions for their children as well as yours, which is why everyone should go to crimetalksearch.com and sign up for a background subscription service. I'm telling you, if there is someone in your life that you have just met, okay, you need to check them out. Whether this be friends, whether this be someone you are dating, whether this be parents of the children that your kids hang out with, you need to check it out. You're going to get information regarding their criminal history, marital status, uh, divorce records, property records, things that people probably aren't going to volunteer to you because it's going to make them look bad. We've had more people send information saying, wow, I got involved in this relationship and it turned out this guy had charges for abusing children. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this is parental malpractice. It is dating malpractice if you are not checking people out. Go to crimetalksearch.com you'll be happy you did. There's one way to make sure you start out the new year right. Go to crimetalksearch.com. Next on the docket, 23 years for a man who didn't commit a crime. That's right. That's a Georgia man who spent 23 years in prison, was released this week into the arms of his family almost eight years after DNA evidence presented to in court pointed to another man as the rightful suspect in a 1998 murder. Now, Devonia Inman was released Monday from the Augusta State uh, Medical Prison. He was sentenced to life without parole over a murder uh, that unfolded outside of a Taco Bell in Adele, Georgia. The restaurant night manager, Donna Brown, was fatally shot uh, in the face while in a parking lot. The assailant fled with about $1,700 in cash, um, which was the day's receipts along with the victim's car. When the vehicle was found, authorities discovered a distinctive homemade ski mask left inside the car. The mask would prove crucial, but not until after Inman was already tried and convicted. Now, lacking any physical evidence that tied Inman to the crime, the prosecution played up testimony from four key witnesses, three of whom later recanted their testimony. Now, Inman's legal team tried to call defense witnesses to testify that another man, Hercules Brown allegedly committed and confessed to the murder, but the judge refused to let the jurors hear it, and the prosecutors claimed that there was not one scintilla of evidence connecting Brown to the robbery and killing. Now, before Inman's trial, police had stopped Brown as he was allegedly planning to commit a robbery, and in his car, they found a homemade mask similar to the one linked to the Taco Bell murder. Meanwhile, with Inman in jail, Brown was involved in an armed robbery months after the Taco Bell murder that left two people dead. Brown pled guilty to those murders and was sentenced to life without parole. Years after Inman's conviction for malice murder and armed robbery, the Georgia Innocent Project picked up the case and secured post-trial DNA testing on the mask that showed Hercules Brown's DNA and only his DNA was on the mask. Now, subsequent legal efforts led to a ruling last month that ordered a new trial for Inman after a judge who concluded that the prosecution had withheld evidence tossed out the conviction. So, ladies and gentlemen, in all of the cases that we hear about someone spending decades in prison for a crime they didn't commit, what is the common thread? Eyewitness identification, right? Eyewitness identification. So faulty unless somebody really knows who the person is and gets a good look. And then the next thing, what is it? That's right. Prosecutorial misconduct. Prosecutors withholding evidence because they want to get a conviction. They're more interested in winning than they are doing justice. Remember that. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Another tragedy on Christmas Day. What is it? Did this guy not get what he wanted? I don't know. I think he's just not a nice guy. Justin Kyle Marshall was arrested early Sunday morning, hours after fatally shooting his girlfriend, 
during a Christmas night gathering at her home in Maryland. Now, Marsha was released from prison two years ago after serving a 15-year sentence for a 2004 murder. Uh, he was 17 at the time, and another man pled guilty to second-degree murder in the beating death of another man. Uh, both men were originally sentenced to 25 years in prison, but Marshall's sentence was later reduced to 21 years, and he was paroled after serving the 17 years in 2019. Now, Marshall was currently wanted for assaulting his girlfriend, 37-year-old Tristan Shifflett, in Pennsylvania. Now, police responded to the home at about 6.30 p.m. and found Shifflett with a gunshot wound to the neck. She was taken to the medical center where she ultimately died of her wounds. Now, Mr. Marshall is being held without bond in West Virginia while he awaits extradition back to Maryland. So I guess this is a classic example of past performance is indicative of future results. Bad man, bad man goes to prison, bad man gets released, bad man does the same thing that got him sent to prison. Apparently a high repetition learner. Unfortunately, now there is somebody who is deceased because, well, somebody was still a high rep learner and Normally, the rules of a crime of violence are that you send them to prison, you send the defendant to prison long enough so that they are too old to harm anybody when they get out. I don't know. Did the courts fail? Did the parole board fail? Who failed? Well, obviously, um, Mr. Marshall did indeed fail. We'll give him the presumption of innocence, right? But sounds like we know what he did. And, Consciousness of guilt from fleeing from Maryland to West Virginia would indicate that he probably did something wrong. I don't think he grew up in West Virginia. And finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. I just don't get this, ladies and gentlemen. This guy, Zachary Mancata, 31. He's accused of shooting a man in the back during a dispute over loud music that was playing on Christmas Eve. Now, the victim's family disarmed the, the man, but additional rounds were fired during the struggle and before the police arrived. Now, it's not clear who was playing the loud music and who was objecting to the loud music. The victim was hospitalized that night in stable condition. Mr. Mankata was arrested and charged with attempted first-degree murder and aggravated assault. Mr. Mankata, you are a dumb criminal contestant of the day. It's Christmas, right? Good cheer to all men, all that good stuff, but yet music was playing too loud, and instead of contacting the police to say, will you please turn the music down, and it's unclear who started it, doesn't really matter, but why would you think it would be okay to shoot somebody over loud music? That's just dumb. Mr. Moncada, you not only are dumb criminal contestant of the day, you are just felony stupid, all right? You deserve to have a felony so that you cannot possess a firearm because you are felony stupid. Thanks for watching. That's all we have for you today. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. <laughs>